Good day everyone, my name is Altus Fiyun um, and I've been asked to make a presentation on the status of Fuseric World TR4 in Mozambique. So I will just share my screen with you. There we go. So I've decided to talk a little bit more than just Northern Mozambique where FOC TR4 uh, was detected in 2013 and expand the presentation also to the situation in Africa. And just before I begin, I also want to tell you that most of what I will be present, uh, presenting will be uh, published in an article that will appear in the South African Journal of Science in November uh, on the occurrence and spread of the banana fusarium world in Mozambique. And also there's a lot of people that have been involved in the work that have been done in Mozambique over the years. Um, and I want to acknowledge all of them, but particularly a few people that have been fundamental in the work that we have been doing over there. And I'll start with my colleague, uh, Diane Mostert, who's been working with me for 10 years now. She's the molecular biologist in the group, but she's also taken a lot of responsibilities uh, outside of molecular biology to try and deal with, with the disease um, in, in Mozambique. Then Jamis Amis, who's been my right hand man uh, when we do the trainings and also he's been responsible for surveillance in Mozambique uh, for many years now. He's based in Ampula. Gus Molina, who's been invited to Matanushka Farm so many times to also advise the farm. And he's been fundamental in trying to turn the farm around and make it uh, a new economic unit and, and get banana production going there again. Two other people that have been key in all the efforts in Mozambique, Serafina Mangana, the previous head of plant health, and Antonio Vaz, the current uh, head of plant health in the Department of Agriculture. Connie Fraser, who's been the technical manager at Matanushka for many years, and she's been working with three general managers over there. And finally, but also someone that's been incredibly valuable in discussing Fusarium World at the farm with me, is Eli Matabawani, um, a young man that's been working at Matanushka and now also working for Jacaranda Company over there in Mozambique. So to understand the disease and the threat of TR4 to the African continent, I think it's also important to understand the production systems in Africa. And one can divide the bananas being grown on the African continent in four groups, of which the plantain will be planted mostly in East Africa, where it's almost a staple food, a very, very important crop. Then the Eastern African Island banana, which is a cooking banana that's grown in Central and Eastern Africa. So uh, Uganda, Burundi, Rwanda, DRC are very important growers of this crop and, and it's being eaten as a staple food. So uh, many of these countries are some of the largest producers of banana around the world. Cavendish is a smaller um, group of bananas being grown on the continent. It is grown in all the southern African countries, but also plantations are now expanding on the East African coast countries, um, also here into Tanzania and, and Kenya up there. Uh, and those countries are also growing local sweet dessert and cooking bananas. Um, and the same is happening also on the islands of the East African coast. If one just look more or less on the types of bananas that are grown um, in large quantities, one can clearly see that the plantain makes up a very large proportion of plantains being grown worldwide, more than 50%. And the East African island bananas also make up a large component of all the cooking bananas being grown around the world. Cavendish is not so big. It's about 9% of all Cavendish bananas being grown in the world. But as people try to establish export plantations closer to uh, the export markets, um, these bananas are becoming more 
important as well. There's some export plantations also being planted in, in West Africa. In terms of banana fusaria wilt, it's not an uncommon disease to Africa. Uh, it occurs in most of the banana growing countries where it's been reported and it's been reported for many years since 1924 already um, when it came in with planting material from Latin America when the export industry was expanded to, to West Africa. But also then there's uh, strains that came in from uh, Southeast Asia and from Indian subcontinent. And that came in around the early 1950s and that's also spread to most countries here in Central and East Africa. South Africa, we've got a, a different strain from the race one that's occurring widely in the rest of Africa. We've got the subtropical race four. But the fortunate thing for Africa is that the plantains and the uh, East African Highland banana and obviously also the Cavendish bananas are all resistant to race one. So the damage being caused by FOC race one in Africa is not that severe. That was until TR4 was uh, discovered in northern Mozambique in 2013, um, which obviously posed a a uh, totally new threat to the African continent. Right, now, as I mentioned, it was detected at Matanushka Farm in 2013 when plants turned yellow. Originally, it was thought it might be the subtropical race four coming from South Africa that was introduced over there. But we later confirmed with molecular tests as well as VCG analysis that it was indeed uh, tropical race four that was introduced um, into northern Mozambique. We also expanded this testing and also included sequencing uh, pathogenicity testing. So we were very convinced about the identity of the fungus and obviously it caused a lot of concern. And then to understand the, the threat and the, the chances for movement of this fungus, one also has to look at the landscape in northern uh, Mozambique which is a rather poor area uh, of the continent, um, extremely poor to be honest. And one can see also the, the smaller town and the villages that you find in northern Mozambique is uh, mostly based on local markets. These markets might be selling off uh, cheap products that is brought into the continent but also the selling of fruit and vegetables uh, and uh, other products uh, and the trade in those are very, very important. And one of those products um, is the, the cooking banana that is being found in the area in northern Mozambique, uh, the Blago banana, which is grown just in small patches. It's not continuously grown in the area. So if you have a low lying area, uh, that's quite wet or near rivers, you will find these patches of bananas where the growers will then go and collect the bunches from and take it in to the market. Things did change uh, early in the 2000s when in 2006 um, some investors decided that northern Mozambique might be a good area from where to grow export bananas and the original idea was to expand banana production in northern Mozambique up to 30,000 hectares of banana. Um, it started with one farm called Matanushka that was near to the town of Namialo. Uh, it's in a very dry area so they had to build a, a dam. It was also on the river edge so there was a possibility to irrigate from there. But there were a number of challenges. Um, it was a large plantation of about 1,500 hectares. This was an investor that started the business, so he had to bring in workers from other countries in the world, and this includes Latin America and Southeast Asia, to work on this farm. And then also the movement of people around the farm could not be prevented. And the reason for this is that no one can own land in northern Mozambique or in Mozambique in total. So people can move freely. You can lease land for a period, but you cannot uh, owe it. it. It belongs to the people of Mozambique. And then in 2013, 
the first yellow ring was observed and the TL4 was uh, identified soon afterwards. Just to show you on the map where the Matanushka farm is based, it's here near Nampula or in the Nampula province near Namialo. And if you look at this map, this is just one part of the, uh, the farm. Uh, this is clear that the disease started to develop from this particular spot where it was moved with workers um, who unknowingly basically moved the pathogen around on the farm until the damage started to become very severe. It was also moved to a second property about 200 kilometers away from Matinushka, uh, up at the north there called uh, Lurio Farm. And it was moved there before people even know that the disease occurred at Matanushka. So it was unintentionally um, and probably due to people visiting Matanushka and then moved with the vehicles to Jacaranda where the disease was then introduced. We later also learned that the disease was identified as early as 2010. So one can understand that the disease spread much wider then we originally thought we can uh, stop it from moving. So soon after its first detection, some efforts were introduced to try and contain the disease at the farm at, at Matanushka and to prevent its spread to other areas. And the first was an emergency project that was uh, funded by the FAO, which led to training of people, also to some surveillance and the development of a national strategy for the confinement of TL4 in northern Mozambique. Along with this, we had several workshops to try and determine factors that could drive the disease to become a problem or that could reduce the effect of the disease uh, in the area. And those facts that could reduce it was obviously to find some resistant banana varieties in Africa that could um, resist the fungus if it's been spread to areas where these bananas are grown. To also test some soma clones of Cavendish to see how they will perform in Mozambique. To create awareness, um, build capacity and then something very, very important is to get the, the buy-in of uh, people in Mozambique, uh, industry players, as well as the politicians and the policy makers. Uh, that was incredibly important for us, um, that they actually come on board and help us in the efforts to, to make people aware of the, the threat of, that this disease might pose. Things that might bring it in the wrong direction was obviously the flooding that people found in banana production areas in northern Mozambique is not an exception um, and there were severe floodings in the past few years. And then poor containment, so one had to make sure that containment was better and a lot of efforts was made in this regard with strategy meetings um, and stakeholder meetings where we invited people from all around the world. We brought the politicians and the policy makers, um, brought the media in to try and make people aware of the disease and then also work with the local communities and scientists to show them the disease and the importance and the damage that it can cause and then obviously building capacity for local institutions in northern Mozambique. Around 2008-2009 we and this was before the disease was discovered we also realized that it's important for us to test some African bananas and we did this test in, in Asia, where we tested about seven East African island bananas and, and seven plantain types, and just to see what, how they will respond to the disease uh, once it is introduced into Africa. And what we found was that they were not entirely immune, but they seemed to be quite resistant. And this is a small selection. So at least it gave us a kind of idea of what might happen. If you test these in the greenhouse um, on small plants, however, we, we saw that the disease developed in all of these bananas. So we're not totally out of the woods, but at least we had some idea and, and knew that we should do a much bigger screening eventually. 
In 2015, we also did a screening of some clonal variants that we received from the Taiwan Banana Research Institute uh, at Matanushka. We also did a test in clean areas to look at the production of these bananas. And if you just look at this graph to see more or less how they performed, uh, you will see that we rated them on a scale of one, which means no disease, to five, which means that the plant was dying over a long period um, of about seven months over two seasons. And one can clearly see how the susceptible Cavendish bananas, the incidence increased quite rapidly in this time to, to very severe cases. While we found that the Soma clones performed much better, um, it's not that they were immune. We've got some losses, sometimes up to 20% in some of these, but still their performance generally was much better than the susceptible Cavendish uh, varieties such as Williams and, and Grand Name. Flooding and the movement of people, so the risk of spreading the fungus was investigated as well. So we did counts of the number of plants getting in, um, affected by TR4. After its discovery in 2013, for the first year, we found that the disease did not increase that much. But in 2015, there were incredible floods in northern Mozambique. And all efforts to try and contain the disease was just um, nullified, basically. You can see some of the uh, floods over here and people just moving along the entire farm everywhere um, and spreading the disease very rapidly over there. There were other factors for us to consider as well. The movement of labor onto that farm, which was very, very difficult to, to deal with. Uh, the trucks moving on it to bring these labor um, and also the, the trucks that's transporting the fruit to the uh, markets or to the harbor to export to markets, moved through these plantations and off the land, which uh, was a, a severe concern to us. So something that I did discuss in many of my presentations around the world and which I want to reiterate here again, is that we saw a beautiful farm in northern Mozambique in Matanushka when we first visited that farm and then the disease came in and people have a choice at this stage what should we do should we say that the disease or this suspect plant in the plantation or should we try to cut it down and and deal with this afterwards and to be honest you cannot deal with this disease if you do not report it and try to contain it very early uh, after discovery, it's becoming extremely hard to deal with the disease. This was a picture taken one year later, and you can already see the damage that's happening to this um, specific site, where it's growing and moving to new areas, and another year later, where it becomes almost impossible to contain the disease at this stage and to stop the disease from occurring. And this was the situation with Matanushka that by 2018, uh, it had to fall for insolvency. The farm simply could not continue producing bananas. Uh, the cash flow simply wasn't there anymore and the business had to stop at this stage. So this is more or less what it looked like before at Matanushka. Um, the farm was purchased by a new company, uh, Jacaranda, who is now the owner of the farm and the name has been changed to Monaco River Farm. And many things have changed in the meantime. So the, the entrance control has been improved incredibly with these um, areas built where people, when they visit the farm, can change their shoes and, and even their clothes before they move onto the farm. And then they return the shoes here when they leave the farm afterwards. There is also good disinfectant, um, use of disinfectants and, and housing of anything on the shoes or washing of the shoes and vehicles before leaving, but mostly vehicles visiting the farm will not be allowed onto that farm at all, unless people come to collect some fruit or the people on the farm have to go and buy some uh, necessities in, in town um, and in the area. So the control is so much better than what it used to be. 
The owners have also started to replant the farm with Formisana, which is GC TCV214, one of the SOMA clones coming from the Taiwan Banana Research Institute. And this is a picture of what it looks like today. Um, actually beautiful, and by the end of this year, almost 1,000 hectares of Formisana will be planted onto this plantation. I have to also tell you that this is not without problems. It's not that they do not get sick, but compared to the damage that we saw before, it is so much less and the owners are really trying to manage this as well as they can using integrated approaches. The bunches coming off this farm look very good. Um, it is good enough for selling on the international market, so the farm does look very good at this stage. There has been investment also in activities and research activities in northern Mozambique to try and deal with the disease. In a project in 2019 funded by the USDA and the Department of Agriculture in Mozambique, um, several different projects, research projects were funded. One of that included reducing FOCTR inoculum in the soil. Also to look at the adaptability of Formosana in other areas of Mozambique, especially in the south, where there's also a large expansion of commercial monoculture Cavendish production. To look at the performance of Formosana over time, so certainly we will continue monitoring the situation on farm um, to see what is happening over time as inoculum might increase to determine the resistance of local bananas in Mozambique and also in Africa, to develop molecular markers, um, not only for the detection, but also to measure inoculum load in the soil, as we realize that this does play a, a big role in the development of the disease in tolerant varieties. Then looking at socio-economic and agronomic impact of TR4 in Mozambique, and finally, to do some surveillance and look at the spread of the disease in northern Mozambique. And these efforts are continuing. There are also several projects on TR4 in Africa, and I'm just going to mention a few. One is emergency assistance of TR4 in Mozambique that I mentioned just now. Uh, then there's a big project that's now in its second cycle, accelerating breeding of bananas, and this includes the or uh, concerns the highland bananas that's being planted mostly in Tanzania and Uganda, uh, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There's also the banana, the banana industry grants that I told you about just now, where, which uh, resulted in the better containment measures uh, and the rehabilitation of uh, Matunushka farm and the um, better production that's now happening with at Monopo River Farm, and also the research that was introduced there. We have just completed training of plant protection officials in the SADC region, of which I will tell you just now. And then finally, remote sensing, sensing and digital surveillance to detect uh, Fusarium wilt in Southern Africa. Some work that's being done in that as well. There's a lot of training and awareness everywhere in Africa and for the past four years we've been training people not only in Southern Africa and, and Mozambique and South Africa but also in Central and Eastern Africa, Northern Africa uh, and a virtual training that we just now completed training 18 countries in Southern Africa, also countries uh, on the islands of the East African coast on a number of things, including the identification and management of Fusarium World TR4. Uh, there are also continuous strategy meetings taking place. The first one took place in Stellenbosch in 2014. Last year, at the end of last year, there was another meeting of the African Consortium for TR4 that took place in, place in Maputo. And usually for these meetings, we invite people not only from Africa, but also bring in people from Asia and Latin America that can share their experiences with us. And we try to bring in all role players to, to try and uh, make this um, getting together as, 
as a representative of the industry in large as much as possible. And at this meeting, we identify four key strategic focus areas for the next few years. Uh, one will be to develop early warning systems, do proper surveillance, and also determine the impact of the disease. Secondly, to enhance the biosecurity and quarantine efforts in the continent, biosecurity for large scale monoculture production is more or less in place at the moment, but for the small growers, uh, there is still a lot of work that should be done. To find genetic resistance against the disease and also to develop uh, integrated disease management strategies. Right, so in terms of the importance of the training that we did just now, and as I said, it, it involved all the East or the Southern African countries, and this goes down from DRC, Angola, Zambia, Tanzania, all the way down, and include all these islands here on the East African coast, was basically uh, to try and prepare these countries should TR4 spread from northern Mozambique into these areas, or if it's introduced from other areas. But we had an incident last year, at the end of last year, where uh, the disease was also detected in Mayotte Island, which is one of the French territories just off the East African coast. This has now been reported also in plant disease and serious efforts are trying, are in ongoing now to try and also limit the spread of the disease from there. But questions are also being asked on how did it end up here in Mayotte and where's the next place where we will detect this disease. So certainly there's still a lot of work for us to do. And with this, I thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation.